Hi, my name is CJ Noor. Uh, my student number is 400-243-202, and I'm going to be demonstrating to you my Alekinj 2EI5 Project 3, um, and today's date is April 1st, 2022. Thank you. I would just like to preface this by saying that in the first schematic scene, the V in should be measuring after the source resistor, and for all the schematic scene, the 100 microcoulomb capacitor should be actually 10 microcoulomb. Alright, so this is the schematic that I came up with. Um, as you can see, straight off the bat, it uses a BJT and it is a common collector, um, but there's a capacitor here. Uh, for reasons explained later, mostly to control the gain. Um, so to answer the first question, I chose the BJT because the input resistance is low and that will not alter with the total resistance of the circuit. Additionally, there's a smaller risk in using a BJT and just I generally prefer working with BJTs over MOSFETs in calculations and physical circuits. Uh, this is because they're very straightforward as their pinout only contains three pins, whereas in our 4007 transistor, um, that contains 14 pins, and obviously there is a pinout diagram. And just when you're following things like that, obviously we know from stats that that leads to a higher source of error. Um, and lastly, it's a, or it is the fastest component in our lab kit, and it obtains the highest GM value. And simply put, the MOSFET just wouldn't work for this, or sorry, uh, a MOSFET wouldn't work for this um, schematic. Uh, to answer the second question, when constructing the amplifier, it is seen that out of the six possible topologies, the common collector and common drain make the most sense in design. Um, I chose a BJT, so obviously I went with the common collector. Uh, that is also because it has the highest input resistance, so when you compare them amongst the other six top, uh, topologies, um, this is important because the required gain is 0.9 and that's only obtainable with the high input resistance and the 0.9 obviously comes from the 10% attenuation as outlined by the manual. Additionally, the intrinsic gain is very close to 1, meaning that the equation would be altered very little or not at all. Also, there's a sufficient signal swing produced in this topology. And lastly, the common collector just has a small output resistance, so when looking at the equations, of that come along with the common collector this is also important to uh, yield the desired results um, and it produces complete linearity as we'll see later in my demonstrations so as you can see here these are my calculations so initially what i did was i calculated for gm and you can see that I started with the inequality given in the lab manual of VIN absolute value is greater than or equal to 0 0.5. Well, this is derived from the lab manual. And I set up this equation here and substituted in uh, VT and RL as 0 0.025 and 0 0.1s respectively, respectively. And I got 990 millisiemens as my GM. Then I set up an equation for VB uh, to eventually solve for the ratio between R2 and R1. And from that, I set up an equation for IE, knowing that IE is very similar to IC. I then substituted in IE in our general equation of GM equals 40 times IC. So I substituted this simplified version into this um, equation over here. And that gives us this equation right over here. And solving for the inequality or relating it to the inequality of it has to be greater than or equal to 990 millisiemens. Uh, we set up this, we move this over, set it up, and we get this inequality here. And that tells us that it can be greater than or equal to, uh, sorry, 12, uh, 1,270 times R1 is less than or equal to 2,730 times R2. And I'm going to choose the equals and just say that the ratio is 0 0.47. And we'll use this later to, satisfy, uh, to find values of R2 and R1 that satisfy this. Then I calculated IC using the previous equation above. Um, 990 over 40 gives us this for IC. Then I used alpha to calculate IE, giving us a value of this for IE. And I used beta to calculate the value of IB, and I got this for IB. And calculating back for VB, uh, we get this, and that gives us a VB of 3.2. And putting this back into the equation, we get a VE of 2.5 
and to find R's or sorry resistors that will work uh, we let R1 equal to 10k or sorry to uh, R2 equal to 10k and we find R1 is 21.27 kilohms um, and those are the values I'm going to be using in the schematic. So I modeled my circuit using LT Spice and as you can see I started off with a input waveform of 1 kilohertz frequency and half a volt uh, as my voltage and my source resistor is 100 ohms as well as my load resistor as 100, as 100 ohms as stated in the lab manual. Um, I measure my VN over here as that is the voltage going into the BJT and as you can see the collector and R2 get a positive voltage supplied by this battery source over here and R1 and the emitter get a negative voltage supply as uh, connected uh, since they are connected to the negative voltage supply over here. Um, the BJT is set as a preset uh, from LT Spice as the 2N3904 BJT model. Um, and a capacitor is added here to control the attenuation and get the desired results and the V out is measured over here and the supplies are all connected to ground. So for the simulation as you can see it runs above over here and like I stated previously the voltmeters on LT Spice read at V in and that produces the pink wave form um, as seen on the oscilloscope and this voltmeter here at V out produces the blue. As you can see, there's very little attenuation and to provide a transient uh, simulation, I tweaked the uh, simulation command and I provided a stop time of 15 milliseconds as seen over here. It starts saving the data as soon as the simulation starts with a max time, st time step of one microsecond. In order to record the gain on LT Spice, a compromise has to be made and uh, you actually have to zoom in very primitively uh, like so and the values are calculated as such. As you can see, we have um, some values you can pull from here with a tad bit of approximation and finding the highest output would be over here. So you can see 48.4, uh, 40, 485.4 millivolts, sorry. And uh, the calculations are going, you're going to see next. So using that method, I calculated the V in max, the V in min, and from that the peak to peak gave me the V in, and same thing for V out. The gain would be V out over V in, we put our values we obtained over here and we receive a gain that is 0 0.992 which is very close to one and very desirable. So we want to calculate our in. So to do so we need I in the current uh, that goes in and we already are given our V in of 0 0.5. Now since V in oscillates we're going to take the max of 0 0.5 and we'll do the same for the current. So the current displayed I in is seen over here and that comes out to uh, an oscillation. So obviously the average won't work so what we're going to do is zoom in here to calculate an exact value. So we get approximately 0 0.092 milliamps. So in calculating our Rn, we know Rn is over Vn, is Vn over In, and we calculated the input voltage to be 0 0.5 at max, and the current going in is 0 0.092 milliamps as determined through the simulation of the schematic, and Rn is calculated to be approximately 5.43 kilo ohms. So this is my circuit schematic next to my physical circuit over here. Uh, and just a correction I made, this should be 10 microcoulombs, not 100 microcoulombs. Um, so over here you can see we're going to go one by one. So the wave gen is supplied, all the wires are color coded by the way. The wave gen is supplied by W1 over here and that delivers a 1 kilohertz half a volt supply and that goes into our source resistor of 100 ohms and that goes next 
we have our V in measuring in between the resistor and the 10 microcoulomb capacitor, the first one in the circuit. And as you can see, channel one measures as V1 uh, right in between our source resistor and our first capacitor. Now, when we come over to the BJT, we're gonna start off with first our base. So what should be connected to our base is in series, um, our source resistor, our capacitor, and R2 and R1. So you can see that holds true. Our capacitor branches over both sides of the breadboard. So it starts off as the source resistor and goes through measures at V in, goes through to the capacitor. And then as you can see, our R2 of 10K, um, 10K ohms and our R1 of 22K, uh, this is the closest resistor that we had to the calculator result of 21.3 so we will go with that they're all connected in series with the base of the bjt now going up to the collector we have the positive supply of uh, plus five over here as you can see and that is connected to both our collector and our r2 and that holds true our collector and our r2 now going down to the emitter, um, we can see that the emitter has a our second capacitor of 10 microcoulombs and it goes to our V out as well as our load resistor of 100 ohms. So that holds true. We see our capacitor is in series with the load resistor of 100 ohms and that's all in series with the emitter of the BJT. And that reads at channel two as depicted by this wire here and that is this measurement here and lastly our negative uh, su uh supply of uh, voltage of negative five sorry that is the white wire over here and that delivers negative fives to both our 22 uh, k ohm resistor of r1 and our load resistor of 100 ohms so over here i run my simulation and i have my voltage supply set as five volts and negative five volt as my bottom supply. My wave gen is set to one kilohertz frequency with half a volt as my amplitude. And here is my scope. Uh, now you can tell from uh, simply just the oscilloscope results themselves that this is a perfect desired output as the phase is very low and the peak to peak is very similar. Um, I have a math, math channel here used to define the gain and I'll open that in a second, but as you can see, the periods and frequencies are consistent. Um, and yeah, the phase is very close to zero, which is desired. So when I run the uh, math channel, what that does is it divides the output over the input. And obviously over here at the points at which both are zero, it divides itself by zero. Um, and that leads to infinity, but otherwise we can view at points that aren't zero. And that shows to be a, over here, as we can see, a one, a gain of one. And we can actually amplify that. Um, put 200 here. We can see it is pretty much exactly at one and, or at least within the range of 0 0.9 to one. Uh, so these are perfect desired results. So over here, we can see the spectrum analyzer and this just shows the frequency response of the circuit and as you can see pretty much for every input there is an output um, to match it and over here we can see this large spike uh, over here reaches about um, uh, around points or sorry six decibel volts uh, so that is desired um, as we have an input voltage of half a volt and over here, uh, we don't see any spikes in frequency. So we know that this uh, desired input of half a volt uh, works without any discrepancies. So like, let's say if we were to upload, or sorry, increase this to one volt, we can see there seems to be a small spike in the output. So that's a sign of, dis sign of distortion. And if we go up to two volts, yeah, the spikes get pretty uh, much more prevalent. And that is, um, a sign of distortion but I mean otherwise uh, going up to one volt as you can see there isn't too much distortion that occurs if any at all so um, the circuit is built well 
So we can actually see over here, um, once again, we have a desired gain of one. Uh, there we go. A desired gain of one or practically near one. Um, I believe if we add a channel, we can see the average. And yeah, so that is our gain calculated over here. Very similar to our simulations ca uh, calculated before. Um, and yeah, that is a desired gain as that is greater than 0 0.9. Additionally, we can see in the spectrum, since they are nearly identical running at half a volt, uh, this is a big indication that they are linear and this passes the test.